We are continuing our series entitled The Roots of Truth, and our subject for today is The Other Adam, The Other Adam. Uh, as I've explained on previous presentations, I'll do it again. The reason for The Roots of Truth is because we're trying to show through this series that the major doctrines of the Bible, many of them, what Seventh-day Adventists would call present truth, are all rooted, all originate within the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, and surely within the first 11, but particularly within the first three chapters. Now, why is the root of a truth so significant? It is the root that establishes the general direction of that teaching or that subject that someone may be studying. And without that initial direction, the person is at risk of going off into error with the very best of intentions. Uh, we have said before, we'll say it again, that Jesus Christ used this method when responding to the Pharisees in Matthew 19 from verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And so Christ takes the Pharisees all the way back to the beginning before there was sin to answer the question regarding marriage and divorce. And in verse 8, he repeats this principle. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And so Jesus is our supreme example of employing this principle of beginning the study of any Bible subject, whether it's the second coming or the judgment or righteousness by faith or conversion or forgiveness or the Sabbath or the state of the dead, any one of those subjects and many others, when they're studied, they should be studied where that subject first appears in the Bible. And as I said earlier, it is my belief from biblical observation that the major teachings of salvation have their origin in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, particularly, and in a larger sense, within the first 11 chapters. That's why we use the theme title, The Roots of Truth. But this presentation carries the title, The Last or the Other Adam. This, I should tell you up front, this presentation is on a subject that is highly controversial within the church. And when I say the church, I mean the Seventh-day Adventist church, particularly because that's the church of which I'm a member, and to some other degree, uh, other churches within the body of Christianity. But having said that, I invite you to listen to the entire presentation before you pass any judgment or before you decide to uh, stop listening. I don't want you to do that midway in the presentation. I want you to have the courage to listen from beginning to end, then draw your conclusions as to what it is I would have said to you in this presentation. The other Adam. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, and we shall read from verse 26. Genesis 1, reading from verse 26, the Bible says, and, the Lord, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, if you read that verse, or oh, let's read verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Now, if you read that passage, Genesis 1, 26, to the middle of verse 28, you get the impression that Adam and Eve were made at the same time. And when God said, be fruitful and multiply, he said it to them at the same time. And when he said in verse 28, 29, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, the impression that the casual reader receives is that God spoke these words to Adam and Eve at the same time. But the reality is, it did not occur that way. And this is demonstrated quite clearly by reading the sequence of events in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. Let's go from verse 7 of Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's action number one. Second action in the sequence of events 
in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And so we have God. He made Adam alone. Then he makes a garden, and he puts him in the garden. Verse, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now God introduces Adam to the source of food. And that was fruit trees. Then from verse 10 to verse 14, we have the account of the river that divides into four heads. Verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now God makes Adam, verse 7, makes a home for him, verse 8, identifies his source of food, verse 9, puts him into the garden and tells him, This is your work, take care of this garden, dress it and keep it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now God gives Adam limitations on his behavior. God announces a test. And the test is that Adam must avoid one tree. Of all the hundred, perhaps thousands of trees, Adam is to avoid one. And by extension, of course, Adam and Eve. But at the point that God makes this statement, only Adam is alive. Verse 18, well, verse 17, God gives the punishment for violation of this restriction. So God gives Adam restrictions. Your behavior can't cross this boundary. If you cross, this is the consequence, and that's death. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And God does not necessarily say that to Adam, but this is God's conclusion as he looks at uh, his creation, which is not yet finished because someone else still has to come to complete the whole work so that God can say in verse 31 of chapter 1, everything was very good. Then in verse 19, we read, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Again, Eve is not present. She has not yet been made. And God brings the animals to Adam, that Adam might name them. And by naming them, according to the biblical tradition and understanding, he establishes his authority over the animal kingdom. An authority God had already announced in verse 26, dominion that he would have. But God invites him now to establish that, to express his role as the, uh, the caretaker of creation by naming the animals. Then, from verse 21 to verse 23, God makes, up to verse 22, God makes Eve. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. Verse 21 of Genesis 2. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, the woman is introduced for the first time. Before she comes on the scene, Adam has been made. A home has been provided for Adam. A source of food has been identified. His work has been identified. The fact that he would receive someone to be a companion to him has been mentioned or hinted at. He's allowed, invited to exercise dominion by naming all the animals. Actually, the Bible says every living creature Adam named, large and small. When all of this is in place, then God makes... Eve, verse 21, 22, and brings her to Adam. And this is significant. God does not bring Adam to Eve. God brings Eve to Adam. Because as we shall find out later on, Eve was made for Adam. Actually, it's found in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse uh, 8 and verse 9. So God brings her to the man. But earlier, God had brought something else to Adam as an indication of his headship, his leadership role in this flawless, sinless environment. In verse 19 of Genesis 2, the Bible says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam. Not Adam to the animals, because this action symbolizes Adam's headship role, his leadership role, his dominion over the natural world. So the animals are brought to him to express his position as leader. 
Eve is made and she is brought to him and a similar sentiment is expressed that the woman is made for him. He has a leadership role, not over all the animals, but also in his relationship with this new woman called Eve. And so she is brought to him. Now, as you listen to these remarks, let me pause and introduce this uh, concept or this thought, which may help you to receive these words I'm saying uh, more easily. When we read the Bible for what it says, when we seek to follow the lifestyle the Bible prescribes for us, when we seek to do that seriously, that lifestyle will be so different from the lifestyle of the world that we will be shocked. A friend of mine wrote me a few days ago an email, and the person said, the consciousness of doing right has disappeared to such a large degree on this earth that when a person makes a commitment to do right, the person is viewed as though he or she is doing wrong. That's the state of the world in which we live. I said that to say, as I make these remarks that go contrary, particularly in a Western society, and most particularly in the United States, it may come across as foreign. But bear with me as I go through my presentation. And so Eve is brought to Adam as a gesture of the fact that he has leadership role, he has a headship function over her, over creation. Verse 23, the Bible says, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And then he gives the reason. Because she was taken out of man. It's very clear from what I've said so far. I am dealing with the question of headship in the home and in the church. To whom has God assigned the role of head? and leader in the home and in the church. And this is the question that I'm dealing with in this presentation, the other Adam. And so Adam names Eve as he named the animals. Let me be very clear by what I meant by that. I'm not equating Eve with the animals. Please don't think that. I'm simply saying the act of naming was an expression of headship or dominion. The act of naming the animals as verily as the act of naming Eve. And by the way, Adam named Eve twice. In verse 23 of chapter 2 and in verse 20 of chapter 3. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And so he names her twice. What we have so far is evidence, reliable biblical evidence, that it was God's original design before sin that the man would occupy the headship role in his home, in society, and in the church. Now, Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's read from verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 2 as we continue the other Adam. Paul says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. For I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first made, then Eve. Now, here is a, a Paul going back to the root of this doctrine of male headship. Paul is counseling the church. The woman should not have headship function over the man. And the reason he gives for that is not sociological. It is not anthropological. It is biblical. And he goes back to a time when there was no sin. And I'm sure you've probably read articles that said the same thing I'm saying now. And Paul says, the reason I am saying that is that the man was made first. What he's telling us is that the reason God made Adam first, it was not accidental. It was deliberate and purposeful. The primacy of his creation, the fact that he was made first, was intended to show that he would have the leadership role, the headship role, even though he and the woman were to be equal, as verily as God the Father and God the Son are equal, but they have different functions. That's another concept that's very difficult for human beings to understand, that two people equal, one can have headship function over the other, but that's the way the Godhead functions. And because man was made in the image of God, that headship arrangement was to be reflected in the way men and women interacted in the home, society, and in the church. The man was designed by God to be the head, not the dictator, but the head. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Paul says, But I would have you know that the head of the man is Christ, of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, Paul is very balanced. Paul is saying, as verily as the woman has a head, 
the man has a head and Christ has a head. In other words, this concept of someone being in charge or someone having a leadership role over someone else is of a heavenly origin. Let me say that again. It is of a heavenly origin. No wonder this sinful earth finds it so disgusting because the thing, the spiritual things tend to make very little sense, if any, to the carnal, unconsecrated mind. And there are many carnal, unconsecrated minds sitting in the pews of churches all over the world. Let me say it again. The things of heaven are ridiculous to the carnal mind. But the system that operated and operates in heaven with respect to the Father having dominion over the Son, despite the fact that they're equal, that system was to be reflected in human living on this earth when God created the heavens and the earth. And God did not change that system despite sin. So Paul is saying that the head of the woman is the man. As verily as the head of the man is Christ, and as verily as the head of Christ is God. And so Paul is saying, the system I am urging the church to follow, male headship, it's, it is reflected in heaven. That's the way things are above. And so we have Paul going back to the roots of the biblical teaching of male headship to encourage the members of the church at Corinth. And there are several of the Bible passages that could be used, but we haven't got the time. Now let's go back to Genesis. We have seen that God made the man first, gave him all the information he needed to have, told him about the limitations on his behavior, the test, the probationary period he was under. And God expected Adam to pass on that information to Eve. That is a function of leadership, to inform and on occasions to instruct because the handling of information is a critical part of the exercise of leadership. And so it was Adam who informed Eve about the prohibition God placed on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was Adam who told Eve whatever she needed to know. God, Adam got it from God, and Adam gave it to Eve. As verily as Christ receives from the Father, and Christ gives it to us, or to the angels, or to Gabriel, Gabriel to the angels, the angels to us. There is a hierarchy of operation in heaven, and that was to function on the earth. It did not reflect negatively on internal worth. What do I mean by that? A man is not of greater value to God than a woman. It is not easier for a man to be saved than a woman. That's not the point we're making. The point we're making, that equality of essence does not change the fact that there's difference in function, difference in office, difference in administration. For example, nowhere in the Bible does the Holy Spirit tell the Father what to do. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does the Son tell the Father what to do. Even though all three are equal, it is the Father that instructs the Son, and it is the Son and the Father that instruct the Holy Spirit. Yet each one is fully God. Let's pause. From what we've seen, if we shall read honestly and reasonably, accepting the invitation from Christ in Isaiah 118 to reason, come now, let us reason together, we have seen clearly that at creation, God's arrangement was that the man would be the head. There are some people who say because of sin, that was changed. Because of sin, it was not changed. Had it been changed, Paul would not have said what he said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. Another reason why the man had headship, and this was added after sin, is because the woman sinned. 1 Timothy 2, verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Sin entered the world through the woman. She was deceived, Adam was not. So that's another reason God gives and Paul gives to the church why headship remains with the man. But the original reason was not based on sin. It was simply based on the order of creation. The man came first as an expression of his leadership role. Now, our subject is the other Adam. We know that the world became so soaked in sin that God decided to destroy the earth with a flood, which he duly did in chapter 7 of the book of Genesis. In 6, God comes down. Well, God doesn't come down, but he talks to Noah. And he tells Noah in verse 13, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy the earth with a flood. Genesis 6, 13. And then he gives him instructions for the building of an ark from verse 14 to verse 16 of Genesis 6. Then God tells Noah 
in verse 17 of Genesis 6. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And every living thing that I have made, or every living substance, will die. That's what God says. Everything will die. Verse 18, but with thee will I establish my covenant. Now listen to God. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Now, the ark is a symbol of salvation. Yeah, 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 verily, it's a symbol of Christ. When it comes to issues of salvation, there is no difference between male and female. That's the essence of Galatians 3.29, uh, 3.28. There's no bond nor free, there's no male nor female, but you're all one in Christ. So God tells Noah, you must come into the ark, your sons, your wife, your son's wives. Now this is repeated over and over between Genesis 6 and Genesis 8. Either you all come in or you all go out. We look at these references. In chapter 7 of Genesis, we're reading verse 1, we see God saying the same thing. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house. What is meant by his house? Verse 18 of chapter 6 tells us, Noah, his sons, the three sons, the wives of the sons, and Noah's wife. Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And so what the invitation God gave in Genesis 6, 18, he repeats in Genesis 7, 1. Now it's the Holy Spirit inspiring Moses to be very detailed. Noah, his sons, his wife, his sons' wives. In verse 7 of chapter 7, the Bible says, And Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his son's wife into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Again, we have the list of those who went in, male and female, husband and wife, father and son. In verse 13, in the selfsame day of Genesis 7, entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wives, and the three wives of his sons with him into the ark. It's repeated again in verse 13 of Genesis 7. In verse 23, at the end of that verse, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Who was with him in the ark? His three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his wife, and the wives of his three sons. And so the Bible is very precise and repetitive because when it comes to salvation, there is no difference between male and female. Let me stress this again. The same blood Christ shed for a man, he shed for a woman. The same blood he shed for the poor, he shed for the rich. The same blood he shed for the educated, he shed for the illiterate. The same blood he shed for the white, he shed for the black. This must be very clear. On the basis of salvation, everyone is invited into the ark who will enter at God's invitation. In chapter 8, verse 15, And God said unto Noah, Come thou, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy wives, thy sons' wives. Now God tells Noah time to get out, and he identifies all the occupants, Noah, his wife, his sons, the wives of his sons. And in verse 18, and Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. And so we have Genesis 6.18, Genesis 7.1, Genesis 7.7, Genesis 7.13, Genesis 7.24, Genesis 8 to 16, Genesis 8, 18. In all these verses, the Bible is very clear. Noah, his wife, his three sons, the wives of his three sons. And where they are not itemized that way, it is clearly suggested. For instance, chapter 7, verse 1. Come thou and all thy house. All thy house clearly means the other seven people who were with Noah in the ark. Now I have to stress this. Because the Holy Spirit does not make mistakes. It was by God's deliberate intention that Moses would keep repeating all those who enter the ark. Because at a spiritual level, as is expressed in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the ark is a symbol of salvation. It's a symbol of Christ. When it comes to salvation, let me repeat, at the risk of being tedium, tedious, there is no difference. In case you missed the verses, let me give them to you again. Genesis 6, 18, Noah, his sons, his wife, the wives of his sons. Genesis 7, 1, Noah and his house. The house, the sons, Noah's wife, the wives of his sons. Genesis 7, 7, Noah, his sons, his wife, the wives of his sons. 
Genesis 7, 13, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah's wife, the wives of his sons. Genesis 7, 24, Noah and all that were with him, of course, the wife, the wives, and the three sons. Genesis 8, 16, Noah, his wife, the sons, the wives of the sons. Genesis 8, 16, Noah, his sons, the wife, the wives of the sons. It almost sounds boring, the extent to which this concept is repeated. When it comes to salvation, my dear friends, there is no difference. Now go to chapter 9. Before we read chapter 9, the flood is over. God has told Noah and his family, come out of the ark. They exit in verse 18 of chapter 8. Noah builds an altar, offers burnt offerings to God. Uh, verse 20, verse 21, 22. 22, God says he, he won't destroy the flood. 21 and 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and wind and day and night shall not cease. Now, why did I name this presentation the other Adam? I'll give you a clue. Listen to Genesis 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now that takes us immediately back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 8, 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Why is God telling the very same thing to Adam, to uh, Noah? Because the world, in a certain sense, is beginning all over again. In that sense, the other Adam is Noah. Let me say that again. Noah is another Adam. The first Adam, he sinned. His posterity sinned so much that God destroyed the earth. And he removed Noah and his family from the earth in the sense that they rolled upon the tops of the waters. They were removed from the earth. With the earth entirely destroyed, then God reintroduces them in a sense. And life on earth has to begin all over as it began in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And so God very understandingly tells Noah and his sons, the women are not mentioned. I say that again. I showed you how often the women are mentioned. Chapter 7, 6, verse 18, 7, 1, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7 30, 7, 24, either mentioned or hinted at 8, 16, 8, 18. In Genesis 9, verse 1, listen to what the Bible says, and God blessed Noah and his sons. Now, is this an accidental omission from the Holy Spirit? There is no such thing. You see, in Genesis 9, God is not dealing now with salvation. He is dealing with the administration of this new world. And as it was before sin, he spoke to Adam first, and the woman was not around. God does the same thing again. He speaks to Adam first, being Noah, the other Adam. And God tells him with his sons, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. When God said that to the first Adam, Eve had not yet been made. And so God is repeating the system that he instituted before sin. He does not change the system. God does not change his standards. He reintroduces it with almost precise wording. Listen to what we read in verse 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Now listen to Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God is telling the second Adam, numerically speaking, Noah is the second Adam, Christ is the last. He tells Noah the same thing, essentially, that he tells Adam. There's a difference in the sense now that there's sin, his dominion must include fear in the hearts of animals for human beings because of sin. But the dominion remains into your hand and the hand suggests control. Are they delivered? In verse 8, well, we can go on uh, before we get to verse 8. Verse 3, every moving thing shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you, all, all things. Now, as God gave food for Adam in Genesis 2 verse 9, he gives a source of food to Noah in Genesis 9 verse 3. I want you to see the parallel. 
and surely your blood of your lives. Before, in verse 4, he tells him, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Now, because there was no meat eating in the garden, it was not necessary for God to tell Adam that. But God puts a restriction on Noah, which Noah is to pass on to his wife and the, the sons to, the, to their wives. As verily as God put a restriction on what Adam could eat, he puts a restriction on what Noah could eat and could not eat. Let me say that again. What I'm saying to you may be new. When God made Adam, he made him before he made Eve, he told him, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. When God started life all over again, having reintroduced humanity into the earth, Genesis 9. In Genesis 2 and 1, God only spoke to Adam. In Genesis 9, God only speaks to Noah and his sons. God tells Adam, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it. God tells Noah, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. We have a parallel. God tells Adam he'd have dominion. God tells Noah he'd have dominion. The only difference was fear would be in the hearts of the animal. God tells Adam, these are the trees you eat. God tells Noah, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. God tells Adam, don't eat that tree. God tells Noah, don't eat things with blood. And so we have restriction on diet, restriction on diet. Dominion over the animal kingdom, dominion. Uh, be fruitful, multiply, be fruitful, multiply. Speaks only to the man, speaks only to the men. Because God is not changing his system. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Verse 6 of Genesis 9, as God continues to give instruction to, Moses, to Noah, and his sons, but the women are not included. Clearly, it would have been the responsibility of Noah and his sons, as it was for Adam, to go and instruct, if you will, instruct, not simply inform, instruct the women as to what the teachings God had given to Noah and to his sons. Verse 8, we come to now the covenant information, directly relating to the church, spiritual life. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying. Again, the women are not mentioned. Remember, they're mentioned over and over in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. They're mentioned repeatedly in the context of the ark, because the ark represents salvation. But in the context of how this new earth is to be run, how it is to be administered, when God gets to that part, God only speaks, Genesis 9-1, to Noah and his sons. When God comes to the spiritual life, uh, the covenant relationship, God only speaks to Noah and his sons. The other Adam, as verily as life began with the first Adam, after the flood, life began with the second Adam. Brand new civilization, as, as if you will, Brought out of the ark, God is saying we're starting all over again. Not at the highest, not at the same moral level because sin is now on the earth, but we're starting all over again. And the same system I instituted before sin, I am reinstituting after sin. And so when God gives the covenant information in verse 8 all the way down to the end of that chapter, chapter 9, God speaks to Noah and his sons. Now let me ask a question. The Holy Spirit that did not forget to mention the women in chapter 6 verse 18, chapter 7 verse 7, in chapter 7 verse 13, in chapter 8 verse 16, in chapter 8 verse 18, the Holy Spirit who was very meticulous in making sure Moses mentioned these women over and over and suggested them in two of, the, uh, two of the passages, chapter 7, verse 1, and chapter 7, verse 24, why would he forget to mention the women in Genesis 9, 1 and Genesis 9, 8? It, it, it is not a matter of the Holy Spirit forgetting. It was not God's plan that the women be involved. It was his plan, as it was in Eden, that the men would be informed, receive God's instructions, and then pass it on by the form of instruction to the women. That is a function of headship. And so we have the other Adam. That's Noah. God begins the world all over and had an opportunity because of sin to change the system 
of leadership. He does not do that. Let me go over the similarities again for the sake of emphasis. Genesis 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 9, 2, God tells Noah, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, every fowl of the air, upon everything that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand. That's dominion, are they delivered? Same thing. God tells Adam, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Verse 28 of Genesis 1. God tells Noah, Genesis 9 verse 1, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. God tells Adam, Genesis 2 verse 16, of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Dietary restriction, God tells Noah in Genesis 9 verse 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Dietary restriction. My brothers and sisters, the issue of male headship in the church is a contentious one. And much of the problem in my humble, amateurish, non-scholarly observation is that too much of what the church does is driven by what society does. And so because we live in a society that continually strives for equality in all areas among the sexes, whatever a man does, a woman must do, that has come into the church. And so the church finds itself with this battle. Ordain women the same way men are ordained, that they exercise headship the same way men exercise headship. It is sociologically attractive. It is biblically unacceptable. Let me say again, headship is not dictatorship. Because the Bible is very clear. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. True biblical headship is the highest form of self-sacrifice. Because a man is the savior of the body. Ephesians 5, verse 22, husband, wives, submit yourselves to, to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. If Adam had functioned as the savior of the body, he would not have joined Eve in sin. As the savior of the body, he would have said, my darling, my love, Eve, you have made a mistake. And in my position, I need to identify your mistake, let you know where you went wrong. Come with me. I'll take you to God. I will speak for you. He's a loving God. He will forgive you. That's functioning as the Savior of the body. And had Adam done that, this world would not be in its condition today. But because Adam failed in his role as a leader, as a Savior of the body, he joined the woman in sin, and here we are today. The Bible is very clear. To someone who will read honestly, the leadership in the home, in society, in the church, is originally reserved for the man at the creation of Adam. When that world was destroyed and a brand new world began and God reintroduced humanity into the earth. Let me speak very deliberately. When God reintroduced humanity on this earth, he set up the same system. When they were in the ark, going into the ark, coming out of the ark, which represents salvation, it was Noah, his wife, his sons, the wives of his sons, and Noah's wife. Over and over again, when God gave instructions for the administration of this brand new world, new in the sense that it's a, a resumption of life, God only speaks to Noah and his sons the way he only spoke to Adam. When God gives information regarding the covenant, Genesis 9-8, he only speaks to Noah and his sons. This is the same God through his spirit, who inspired Moses to mention the women over and over and over with respect to the ark, but did not mention them with respect to the administration of this world. Material and spiritual. My listening friends, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You know, Eloi says when God told Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126, paragraph 1, she says, he could not even explain his course of action so as to be understood by his friends. 
Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and his motives and actions were not comprehended by his idolatrous kindred. When a person decides to do things God's way from A to Z, sometimes members of the church, members of the family, do not understand. Mark 3.21, the family of Jesus Christ went to arrest him. He was preaching in a house. What was their reason? He is beside himself. They did not understand at that point why Christ was doing what he was doing. When Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 16 from verse 31, he had to go to Jerusalem and die. Peter tried to stop him. Because Peter did not understand, and Christ explained why, thou savorest the things that be of men, not of God. Equality of position in the church with respect to both women and men being ordained is not a biblical teaching. It is not of a heavenly origin. It is secularly attractive, yes, but very dangerous. Any deviation from God's plan, however slight, if it continues long enough, will have major consequences, all of them negative. And so I commend to you Genesis 2 and Genesis 9. Study the system God set up in Genesis 2. Then study Genesis 9. When life is reintroduced, and see to whom God speaks, as verily as he spoke to that person in Genesis 2, which was Adam. May the Lord bless you as you contemplate what you've heard. This is the results of my study of the Word of God and learning from others. Let me say that very clearly. But what came very clear to me as I read on this issue is that not much attention had been paid to Noah as the other Adam beginning life all over again. And the fact, and this is repetition, that God spoke to him and the women were not present as verily as God spoke to Adam, suggesting his leadership role, and Eve had not yet been made. I urge you to pray. John 7, 17 says, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. John, Jesus promised in John 16, 13, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Ask God to open your eyes. Ask God to direct and guide you in your study of God's word. And if you do that sincerely, and I believe you will, surely God will speak to you. May God bless you as you try in every area of your life to do things not the popular way, not the way that's widespread in society, but the biblical way. God bless you.